last lecture, we saw what were the effects of strain layers in semiconductors. In this lecture, we will discuss the effects of quantum confinement. This includes the effect of having structures, quantum wells, quantum wires, and quantum dots, which provide very efficient and um, strikingly different uh, optoelectronic devices. So the subject of this talk is quantum confinement and I'll discuss the fundamentals of quantum confinement, the different types of uh, low dimensional structures and finally I'll come to the effects of such quantum confinement in optoelectronic devices such as uh, lasers. Now, we have seen that when we have semiconductors with two different band gaps, then the band alignment, energy band alignment, could be something like, like this. Where this is one semiconductor with a wide band gap, e.g. 1, and this is a semiconductor with a smaller band gap, e.g. 2. Now, if after this we grow the first semiconductor again, what we have is a double heterojunction which, as we know, has been used for the first uh, generation of semiconductor lasers. We have two heterojunctions, uh, boundaries at, say, x e equal to um, minus w by 2 and plus w by 2. What happens if this width w becomes comparable with the mean free path of electrons. We know that the mean free path of electrons in these semiconductors is of the order of, say, 200 angstroms or 20 nanometers. Now, if the width W is less than, say, 200 angstroms, the electrons in the layer 2 are confined in what is known as a quantum well. So the electrons are confined in this direction, but they are free to move perpendicular in the two perpendicular directions, both in, uh, in the y and z directions, if x is the direction of the quantum well. Now, this is a particular case in which we have one-dimensional confinement. And since the electrons are free to move in the y and z directions, they're free to move both in y and z directions, they form a two-dimensional electron gas. Now, suppose we have not just one such quantum well, but we have a number of such wells separated by barriers of width Lb, the well widths being Lw. This gives the conduction band 
energies and this gives the valence band energies. We are talking of lattice match system, so we, this is an ideal system where there is no lattice mismatch, no strain layers and uh, for example this wide band gap material could be aluminium gallium arsenide and the low band gap material could be gallium arsenide. Now if we have LB, the barrier width greater than uh, say 100 angstroms then essentially the electrons in this well and the holes in the valence band are isolated from the next well. In other words, the electrons cannot tunnel through the barrier LB and for the structure that I have drawn, this is what is known as a multi-quantum well structure. We will see that uh, such structures are very useful in uh, semiconductor lasers. However, if we have the barrier widths much less, if we have a structure in which the well and the barrier widths are comparable, as shown here, the well width being LW and the barrier width being LB and LB typically for gallium arsenide is less than 100 angstroms. Then the electrons from this well can tunnel through the barrier and they are in communication with the electrons in the other barriers and as a result the energies of the electrons in the quantum well whereas here they are just discrete like electrons in a Schrodinger potential here they form mini bands and in this case the electrons from the holes form a super lattice so this is the basic difference between multi quantum wells super lattices and if there is a structure like this, uh, this is what is known as a single quantum well, SQW. What we've discussed so far are examples of compositional super lattices because the The material composition is varying uh, in space between, say, gallium aluminum arsenide. Very common super lattices consist of systems like algas gas or in gas indium phosphide or indium gallium arsenide phosphide indium phosphide, which are all lattice matched systems. On the other hand, there are what are known as doping super lattices, in which the material itself remains the same, say silicon, and The doping is varied in a controlled manner. So if we have a Fermi level somewhere here, we have um, a super lattice going from n-type to p-type uh, with an intrinsic layer in the middle. So this is what is known as a NIPI super lattice, NIPI, which also have some very interesting properties such as tunability. However, in this Lecture, we'll talk entirely about compositional super lattices, which are useful in semiconductor optoelectronic devices.
if you have one dimensional confinement, we have quantum wells and we'll see that the energy levels are discrete and the density of states function is also different from the if you have zero dimensional confinement we have uh, a bulk material there is no confinement uh, then the density of states function um, we know n e goes as e to power half and we are interested in seeing what happens if we have one dimensional two dimensional and finally three dimensional confinement uh, suppose we take the next case of two dimensional confinement which is the case of quantum wires um, this can be depicted by whereas for A quantum well will look like will look like this, where electrons are free to move in both this direction and this direction, but they're confined. So this is a quantum well. A quantum wire will look like where the electrons are confined both in uh, this direction as well as in this direction. So this is a quantum wire. And finally, if we confine in three dimensions, the electrons are free in zero dimensions then what we have is a situation in which the electrons are confined in a quantum box or, or a quantum dot. And we'll find that the properties of electrons in such uh, confined structures are quite different from those in uh, bulk uh, semiconductors. We know now to start off with that in the case of bulk semiconductors, we know that the density of states that is NE, the number of states available over an energy DE as a function of energy is given by a variation of this type which goes as e to the power half and the exact relation is 
NEDE is twice M star E, say for electrons, by 8 squared to, to the power 3 by 2 over 2 pi squared e to the power half. So this is the important energy dependence. And uh, this is for electrons having an effective mass me star. So the electrons can occupy um, energies which are very close together. Suppose we have this is EC and this is EV, then the density of electrons if we now draw any e here goes to zero and the density of states in the valence band is something like that. So electrons can occupy continuous energy levels in the conduction and the valence bands. And the curvature is dependent upon the effective mass of the electrons M E H M E star and the effective mass of the holes M H star. What happens now if we go to two dimensions? Electrons being free to move in only two dimensions. This is the case of electrons in a finite uh, in a in a quantum well and we know from elementary uh, quantum mechanics this is a problem of an electron in a quantum well an infinite quantum well and uh, the electrons have now instead of continuous energy levels they have discrete energy levels e1 e2 e3 which are given by this relation e n is equal to n squared 8 squared by 8 pi squared by m n star or m e star this is the effective mass of the electrons in the quantum well over w squared where w is the width of the well here and if the width of the well w or lz is less than about 150 angstroms then this separation E2 minus E1 is more than KT. So if we take the case of the two-dimensional electrons in a two-dimensional um, free in two dimensions in a one-dimensional quantum well, if this is LZ, then E n is n squared, or we can write it as h cross squared over 2 m n star L z squared. And where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. So obviously, if L z is small, less than 150 angstroms, uh, then we find that E2 minus E1 is greater than KBT, that is about 26 milli electron volts at room temperature. This is for gallium arsenide with MN star is equal to about 0 0.065 M0. So in order to see the difference between electrons in a quantum well and the bulk, we have to have the quantum well with Lz 
to be less than about 150 angstroms for gallium arsenide. In the next lecture, we'll see uh, how such wells can be grown, how quantum wells can be grown by techniques such as MBE or MOVPE. Also, it is apparent that uh, the lowest energy level in a quantum well is not EC, the bottom of the this is the bottom of the conduction band, but E1 is higher than EC, de depending upon uh, LZ. And since LZ squared is in the denominator, as LZ is reduced, EN increases very rapidly. So this gives the the energy levels of the electrons in the quantum well for an infinite well. But in practice, we know that when we make a heterojunction between two different semiconductors, the well widths are finite. In this case, for indium phosphide, indium gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, we find that, for example, the conduction band discontinuity is only 0.2 electron volts. The valence band discontinuity is only 0.4 electron volts. These obviously have to be larger than kT for confinement to occur. And these are derived from the differences in the band gap, which is 0.75 for indium gallium arsenide, 1.35 for indium phosphide, and the Anderson rule, which gives that the sum of delta EC and delta EV must be equal to the difference between the band gaps. Well, this is a problem in uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, electron in a finite quantum well and um, using uh, the Schrodinger form formulation it can be solved and the solution uh, is given by this relation alpha tan alpha w by 2 is equal to beta where alpha is the propagation constant uh, square root of 2 m star e by 8 squared um, in the well and beta is the propagation constant in the barrier and one can solve this and uh, one can get the exact energy levels which are uh, obviously different from those in the infinite quantum well. Now what about the density of states? The two-dimensional density of states is also quite different from that in the bulk and one can uh, do a uh, little derivation to find out what is the two-dimensional density of states. Uh, what is NE DE? We know that um, the wave vectors Kx, Ky and Kz are given by Kx is 2 pi by Lz where Lz is the dimension, sorry, 2 pi by Lx for Kx, uh, Ky is 2 pi by Ly, and Kz is 2 pi by Lz. We're considering confined in one dimension. So one of these dimensions, let's say Lz, is much less than Lx and Ly. And so the electrons are free in the x and y planes, okay, uh, but they're confined in the z direction. So we know that the density of allowed modes of points in K space. is Lx into Ly into Lz over 2 pi cubed. So the volume in K space between K 
and wave vectors k and k plus dk is in this case 2 pi k parallel dk parallel over 2 pi into Lz where k parallel is a wave vector in the kx, ky plane. Now we know that the total wave vector is equal to 2 pi over Lz squared plus k parallel squared. This is in the xy plane where the electron is free to move. So we have k dk obviously equal to k parallel dk parallel. Therefore, the total number of states between k and k plus dk is dn, which is equal to 2. This is each state can have, this is a spin factor. Each state can have electrons with two different spins into Lx, Ly, Lz over 2 pi cubed. This is the density of allowed points into 2 pi k dk into 2 pi lz. So simplifying this, we find that dn is lx ly lz over 1 by pi squared k dk pi by lz. But we know that k squared is equal to twice m dE e minus e1, or let's call this en, where n, the quantized level 1, 2, 3, over h squared. Uh, this is just another way of writing that e is equal to h squared k squared over twice m d e uh, in the x y plane. So using the above expression we find that the density of states in the two dimensions is n e d e m d e by pi h squared Lz dE provided E is greater than En. Or if we normalize in terms of in dimensions, we take Lz out, so the density of states turns out to be MDE over pi by h squared d. So this is a very important expression, density of states of a two-dimensional electron gas, and uh, it is to be noticed that on the right-hand side there is no, there is no E dependence. So as a result, we find that the density of states in two dimensions, N E D E, has a step-like behavior.
that this is E1, this is E2, this is E3, etc. And These values are um, given by m star by pi h squared. Uh, here it's twice m star by pi h squared, etc. So this is quite distinct from the three dimensional case where the density of states will go something like this. Starting from zero energy, we have a continuous distribution of density of states. The result is that when the energy of the electron varies, the density of states remains constant. And if we take the case of uh, rather low temperatures, the actual density distribution of electrons in this confined structure is given by something like this. Okay. Whereas in the case of three dimensions, if that is the density of state structure, then the actual energy of the electrons occupying these in three dimension is given by uh, much more varied distribution in energy than in the case of two dimensions. Right. Now, quantum well lasers are extremely important, and uh, we'll discuss these in great detail. But let us just uh, take the case of uh, quantum confinement in quantum uh, wires. These where electrons are free in one dimension. Um, one can easily work out that in this case, the energies in quantum wires will be given by uh, discrete states having two indices, we have, let's say, uh, L squared over L y squared plus M squared over L z squared plus, and the electrons are free to, say, move in the x direction. Now, in the case of quantum box or quantum dots, freedom in zero dimension, then we have E, L, M, N. The energies are quantized in all three directions, and we have What about the density of states? The density of states picture that emerges is something like this, that in the case of quantum wires, we have very sharp spikes in the density of states, and this expression for this is given by NEDE -E is twice m star bar half by h squared, and um, say L y L z
and the en- there is a energy dependence of the form e to the power minus half. So here, the energy dependence is e to the power minus half. For the case of a quantum dot, which has been realized, um, obviously the energies are discrete, and we have the density of states are delta functions, and the energies are given by E11, E12, E113, etc. And this is where the quantum dots we have delta functions, two electron spin factor, LX, LY, LZ. This is L M N delta E minus E L M N. So we have very distinct density of states uh, for these cases of quantum confined layers, and I'll just uh, finish by um, saying that the actual distribution of energies in the for the case of the quantum well is that in the kx and ky uh, directions we have free electron-like behavior, so the electrons are free to move in mini bands. E1, E2, E3, whereas in the Z direction, the electron are confined and have discrete energies, E1, E2, E3. And, of course, we know that um, the wave functions for the lowest level are of this type. For the next highest level, E2, they're of the wave function and is of this type, and E3 is of this type. Okay. So this is for the well. And for an infinite well, the wave functions are confined within the well, but if we have a, a finite well of this type, which is actually realized in practice, then we have considerable penetration of the wave function into the barrier. And then we'll see that the effective mass of the electron in this well is not only a function of m e in the well but of the effective mass m e in the barrier which is a different material this is say aluminum gallimasnide and this is gallimasnide the effective masses are different so when the electrons penetrate into the barrier um, the Overall effective mass is a function of both the effective mass in the well as well as in the barrier. I'll continue next time with a discussion of the uh, effects of uh, quantization in quantum wells and uh, the applications of these in quantum well lasers.